in 2020, I walked into my office and there was a journal, uh, Spine Journal. The lead article in our Spine Journal said, this is word for word, undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. What does that mean? That means our own journal is telling us that our data is tainted. So, so the first thing that needs to happen is to just cut off the influence of these uh, instrument companies from the science of spine surgery. I tell the spine surgeon, I say, look, if I'm wrong, if this screw is the best that it gets, okay, I'll just, you know, complain. Eventually I'll shut up and I go disappear. Fine. But if I'm right, and that's what the research says, can you imagine what we've done to our patients? Can you imagine what we've done to medicine, to healthcare? Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is Dr. Artavan Asli. He is a spine surgeon. And we're going to be talking about not just spine surgery, but the use of a medical device called the pedicle screw, which has been proven to be ineffective and is being used as part of standard operating procedure and his mission to get the medical community to change many things for the better. But first, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests, a little bio on myself. There's also a YouTube channel where you can listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. As I said, my guest today is Artavon Osley, MD. He has been a spine surgeon for over 20 years, and we discuss everything about spine surgery from what a spine surgeon actually does in the operating room, how they diagnose, uh, what are some of the things that uh, they can, can tell from MRIs and some of the things they can't tell from MRIs, what is the training that a spine surgeon goes through and how that can be changed for the better. And then we get into this medical device called the pedicle screw, which has been shown by many scientific papers not to be something that's effective and how it has been perpetuated, and he's going to talk about why and how that affects medical care. It's a very eye-opening discussion. I learned a lot about not only uh, spine surgery, which I didn't expect to do, well, um, happily, I, I uh, <clears throat> know more about it, but also what goes on behind the scenes. And I'm sure it's, this is not just something that goes on in uh, spine surgery, but other branches of the medical profession. Dr. Osley is a very committed guy. Uh, and if you're thinking about having any kind of spine surgery in particular, this is a must-listen episode because lots of things can happen when you do not have the right information. So here he is. This is Dr. Artavon Osley. Welcome to the uh, show, Dr. Osley, and I'm happy that you're uh, here. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff with uh, spine surgery, which I know a little bit about, but not a lot, and what is uh, transpiring in that world that uh, we need to look at in your new book corporate spine. So let's, we'll be talking about that, but let's talk about your, um, a little bit of what we were talking about before, which was what you actually do. And then we'll go from there. First, I would like to thank you for inviting me to the program. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I am a orthopedically trained spine surgeon. Uh, you can become a spine surgeon by two, uh, taking two roads. One is through, uh, when you finish medical school, you do a residency in orthopedic surgery, become an orthopedic surgeon first. Then you do a year of fellowship in spine surgery. Then you can practice as a spine surgeon. The other uh, route is go through neurosurgery. So after you finish medical school, you do about, 
I think six years or seven years of neurosurgery. And then you elect if you want to do extra training, like a year of fellowship in spine surgery. And then you start uh, practicing as a spine surgeon. Initially, uh, like 1990s, uh, there was a difference, a little difference between the two, like uh, orthopedic surgeons were good carpenters. They would use uh, screws and do scoliosis, uh, which is a deformity of the spine. But then I would say starting about 2000s on, especially these days, the training is very similar. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the uh, fellowships, they take one neurosurgeon and one orthopedic surgeon, and we go to each other's conferences. So there is no difference anymore. I became a uh, spine surgeon in 2002. I finished my training. I went to Berkeley undergrad, uh, New York Medical College Medical School. And I did my residency in St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, Manhattan, Greenwich Village. But now it's closed, uh, turned into apartments. And then I did my fellowship in uh, Beth Israel and Brigham Women's Hospital in uh, part of Harvard University in Boston. And uh, I ended up, I'm from California. My mother lives in Berkeley. And uh, I wanted to come to Northern California. And I found a job in a city north of Sacramento called Yuba City, and I started my practice. And it's just kind of interesting because um, when I went to Yuba City, I was questioning myself, you know, do I want to go to a small town? Uh, what is the uh, perception of doctors who practice in a small town? And I can tell you right now, uh, practicing in a small town was absolutely necessary uh, for me to grow uh, as a spine surgeon and learn spine surgery. Why? Because uh, the most important aspect of spine surgery, and, it, and every spine surgeon will tell you that, it's not doing the surgery. Uh, well, that's important, but actually more important than that is to know what type of surgery uh, to do on a, on a patient. Uh, and that's a very, very complex process that you learn through decades. And as you go along throughout your career, you change. Uh, for example, I can tell you when I first started my practice, I had learned, you know, I was trained in fellowship and I was trained for these huge surgeries. I would come out and, you know, I was uh, ready to do these big surgeries, multi-level fusions, uh, deformity or so. And I would see that the older established surgeons were doing all these smaller surgeries. And my reaction was that, oh, probably they're not trained very well. You know, it was an older, older generation. They didn't know much and, um, and, you know, they don't know better. And then 20 years later, I find myself exactly in the same spot as them uh, that I'm trying to do smaller and smaller surgeries. <laughs> and I've almost abandoned all the big surgeries. Why? Because when you're in a small town, uh, it's always you bump into your patient, uh, your patient's neighbor is a friend of my uh, office manager, uh, my office manager knows the cousin of one of our patients. So there's always a follow up. I knew exactly how my patients were doing. Because when you see the patient back in your office, um, for like 20 minutes or so after surgery, you really don't get to know them, to really understand what's going on with them. As a matter of fact, a lot of surgeons and busy surgeons, good surgeons, they have physician's assistants that, you know, they do the follow-up, they do all these other uh, things that surgeons, you know, is either too busy to do, or I don't know, I mean, I can't speak for them. Uh, but so the follow-up drops. And sometimes I tell my friends that once you stop decreasing your contact with the patient, what happens is that you stop learning. Uh, why? Because spine surgery is not like other specialties that is repetitious, like uh, eye surgery, like anesthesia or so. Um, I don't want to shoot them down, but you know, a part of the practice becomes repetitious. Spine surgery, when it comes to neck and back pain, everybody's different. Everybody. I mean, I've been in practice for 20 years, every time I come to office, I see a patient, there's a chance that I've never seen somebody with that specific complaint. 
Um, so spine surgery is a, is a continuously learning, developing type of a field, which is good and bad. It's bad because, well, the patients come to you with questions, you know, and of course their question is, what's going to happen to me? What do I expect? What are the treatments? Uh, are the treatments going to work, not going to work? Uh, well, unfortunately, because everybody's different, we don't have those answers for them. We can't tell them that, hey, this is what's going to happen, or this is what you need to do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's very good because my job is not boring at all. It's constantly challenging, constant learning, and you know you develop as you practice. Um, so let's talk about some of the uh, parts of the spine surgery and what we go through. Uh, what are the most important questions that my patients ask me? Um, who is surgical candidate? Who needs surgery? That's one of the biggest questions. Yeah, and this sure. is how, and this is what I tell my patients. For somebody to need surgery, to be a surgical candidate, two things need to happen. One is a patient that has tried everything. Uh, and by everything, um, I divide my patient, I mean, I divide the uh, non-surgical care or, or, or back pain treatment into three stages. The first stage is what we call manipulative treatments. Uh, the whole idea is to manipulate the body with one technique or the other, try to get them better. In that category, you have chiropractic care, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage therapy, you name it. It's a whole world. Uh, and I like chiropractic care. I'm a different type of a spine. Most of my spine surgeon friends, uh, they prefer physical therapy. I prefer chiropractic care because the manipulations, uh, it's, I'm just kind of going, but, but I like chiropractic care more than uh, physical therapy for people who have not had surgery yet. Uh, in the second stage, so the first stage is manipulative treatment. Second stage is what we call therapeutic injections or therapeutic procedures. Uh, and those are mainly steroid injections. Uh, we have stero I tell my patients, we have steroids and we have really nothing else. There are other medicines that we inject. Uh, stem cell is very popular these days. Uh, there's uh, something called PRP, uh, platelet-rich protein, which is part of your blood. You know, you draw your blood, you spin it, and the area that's more platelets, you inject it back to the spine. Those are very experimental. They work well in orthopedic surgery, but they're not working very well in the spine. Cortisone is what we have. Problem with cortisone is that it's a very unpredictable medicine. It is and behaves more like a hormone as opposed to medicine that's pred predictable. Uh, and of course, the different injections differ in terms of the depth, how deep they go. So once, and the third and last step is surgery. So once a patient goes through this stage and tries these and they're not better, then the patient needs to make a decision based on how much pain they have and if they can handle that pain. If they have come to a point that they can't handle the pain and they cannot live like this, then the patient decides to proceed with surgery. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. The patient that has decided that wants to proceed with surgery. After all, I tell my patients, I cannot look at the MRIs and say, what's going to happen to you or, uh, or how much pain you're in. Uh, in my world, looks don't matter. I have MRIs that are looking horrible, and the patient is like, I'm fine. I'm okay. I got some little tightness, but I'm good. I have patients that their MRIs actually report was negative. I ended up doing surgery on it. Uh, these are the patients that they would not leave my office. They would cry and uh, mm -hmm. cry and cry, visit after visit. And uh, and I would don't want to do surgery, but eventually I had to because... And I've explained in my book in detail the interactions. But as I always say, the decision for surgery, proceed with surgery, no, it's a patient's decision, not the surgeon's. So first thing that needs to happen is a patient that has tried everything and they're not better. The second stage is for a surgeon to identify a problem on the MRI that explains patient's problems. So let's say uh, they have a... <clears throat> neck pain uh, that radiates into the thumb. That's a distribution of what we call C6 nerve root. I look at the MRI, if they have a, 
that disc, damaged disc at the level of C5-6, and that's the nerve that goes to that thumb, then that's it. You know, uh, they both fit. If the MRI fits the patient's complaint, then I can tell the patients that, yes, there is something that I can do. I can do the surgery, and you have a very good chance of getting better. And I divide my patients into two categories. And this is very important for patients to understand. Why? Because I have to deal with, and I still deal with it, with the reputation of spine surgery. I get a lot of patients come to my office and say, we heard the spine surgery doesn't work. We've been warned that if you mention surgery, don't take it and all that. And I've, you know, in 20 years of practice, I've come to accept that. Uh, but I really think that spine surgeons have not trained, have not thought or trained the people, the patients. So the patients understand what we have to deal with. They haven't done that really favor to themselves in a way. So I tell my patients, I divide my patients into two categories, simple and complex. Simple if they have one or two discs that are bad or injured on an MRI. Complex if they have three or more. Why is that important? Well, it's important because in a simple patient, if they have one or two discs, the problem is local. Once you have three or more discs that are bad, then the problem goes from a localized problem into a regional problem. Well, People who have localized problems, like a one or two discs that are bad, they do very well with surgery. Uh, probably, let's say we do a fusion surgery and, and they're good. Um, the results are good. You know, once in a while you have patients that are not better, but you know, uh, the chances are they're, they're successful surgeries. Now, patients who have three or more discs that are injured, those are the patients that you hear they have surgery and then they have another surgery and, you know, and on and on and on. Well, I have to explain to my patients that unfortunately they have a problem that uh, it's not a realistic expectation of a surgery going in and fixing everything. In that case, we're talking about managing the patient throughout their life, his or hers life. Well, in that situation, a staged surgery or a surgery that, you know, fix a problem, but then knowing that it is going to kind of a prudent that another problem is going to pop up later on because we don't stop living, you know, life continues. Uh, that's something that is expected. And actually, in my book, I've explained that a staged surgery uh, is actually an appropriate way to tackle that problem. And that's something that the patient needs to understand. Why? Uh, what I've learned in my practice is that if you do, you know, nobody wants to go to the surgeon's office and the surgeons tell them uh, you might need a couple of surgeries. Uh, and, and I'll get back to that. And that's, a, in a way, kind of a travesty because everybody wants to get one surgeon get fixed. Um, sometimes I have to tell them if I do, I've learned in 20 years of practice, if you do one big surgery, then if there's a problem, then you're going to have a really hard time to figure out what the problem is. And these patients end up in pain management for us, their lives. But if I break the surgery into two smaller surgeries and go step by step, if there's a problem, I can figure it out. And chance of fixing it is a lot easier. And not only that, uh, it's chance of healing if you break it up to surgery is much, much better. Um, so that's something that I have to explain to my patients. That makes a lot of sense. This is something that I've learned throughout, you know, decades of practicing, you know, because we did those, I did those big surgeries and I saw these patients that they didn't do well. I mean, the surgery itself introduces a trauma to the spine. Um, it all, a success of surgery, it all comes down to one thing. After six months after surgery, you ask the patient, now where you are, now you know what you feel right now today, would you have done it all over again? Mm -hmm. If the patient says, oh yeah, I, oh yeah, sure. Oh no, I would have still done the surgery even though I have some pain, but yeah, then I call that a success. But if the patient says, no, no, I don't think surgery did anything. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, oh God, I wish I didn't do it. Or no, I, I have second thoughts about doing the surgery. Then that's not a success. So that's a failure. So that's, you know, then we have to figure out what we're wrong. But I learned was that, well, a lot of times the problem is that actually a simple problem. 
for example, sometimes we put these screws in, the screws actually hurt the patient. So we can go in, take the screws out, and the patient feels a lot better. Uh, sometimes we just have to wait. What it looks to be the problem in the MRI might not be, and that's what makes our job so difficult. Uh, because not only uh, we have to go with what we see, but we have yeah. to go by it intuition and that intuition takes decades for it to mature um so let's go back to controversy in spine surgery would you would like to hear that yes well that was <laughs> that was very intriguing to me I, uh first of all thank you for that uh, wonderful explanation um if anybody uh is contemplating uh, spine surgery you just heard the whole story of <laughs> what to expect from somebody who actually cares. And I think probably most surgeons do, but uh, you know, there are some people that maybe don't. Um, but what, what I was really uh, interested in was uh, the fact that they are using, uh, they, you, everyone in spine search is using these screws, pedicles here. Is that what they're called? Pedicle? Correct. And Correct. Uh, you'll have to explain what that word means, but um, screws that are not, um, really proven to be um, uh, efficient and uh, with longevity and success. And, you know, I know someone who um, she had uh, surgery. She was an athlete of some sort. And she had, uh, she says, I have six screws in my back. She was laid up for a long time. She seems to be doing okay. But I, I wonder, you know, when I, when I think about screws in my back, <laughs> I don't, I'm like, eh. So, you know, right. I don't know what they're made out of. I don't know how deep they go. I don't know what they do. So you're going to explain why and also the the industry that makes medical devices. And this isn't the only medical device out there, but this is the one you know probably the most about. So go, let's let's find out about this. It's pretty right. uh, it's pretty alarming, actually, when I read your uh, bio. Yes. Well, stick around because it's going to be very interesting. You know, when I was finding these facts, every time my jaw dropped and I thought that it cannot get worse, it got 10 times worse. Mm. And it was step by step. Um, and I'm ashamed of what we've done so far. Let's put it this way. I am ashamed of our specialty for now. Um, and I will explain why. So let's go back into the history of spine surgery. So we knew right around 60s and 70s and 80s that when a disc goes bad, it can produce pain. Well, the treatment for that, we came up with this surgery called fusion surgery. What it is is that we go either from the front or the back of the spine, remove the disc, and put a spacer between the two bones, yes or no. Uh, but basically, the whole idea is to put some bone chips between the two bones, between the two vertebrae, either neck or the lower back or, or mid-back, and hoping that those bone chips will fuse together, will turn into one bone. And we started getting good results. The problem is that about one out of four patients, so 25% of the patients, that's a very large number, did not happen. It did not, that those bone chips didn't turn into a solid bone. Therefore, they ended up what we call non-union. Well, in these patients, the pain comes back 10 times worse. So mm -hmm. actually they get worse, you know. So we were looking for ways to uh, increase that healing percentage uh, so we have better outcome. Well, uh, being orthopedic surgeons, we knew we had, we, we dealt with fractures, you know, bones that break and, you know, we have to heal them together. We had learned uh, from our experience that the key for a bone to heal is an immobilization. We want to hold the bones together, immobilize, so they can heal together, basically. Uh, in 1960s or so, a German team, Swiss German team, came up with this idea that you can heal the fracture much easier instead of casting by uh, putting a plate against the bone with some screws to hold the bone ends together. We call this the AO technique, capital A, capital O, AO technique, which is what we call a rigid fixation of fracture ends. And that worked beautifully in terms of fracture fixation in arms and legs. Well, you know, so we had learned that the key is immobilization. 
Well, right around 1985, two surgeons from France, they figured out a way to put a very large screw, a screw that is like seven millimeters in diameter and sometimes about uh, 45 millimeter to 60 millimeters in length. So it's a very large screw that gets inserted from back to front, uh, one on each side of the vertebrae. In the middle, you have the nerves, but on the sides, you have these two columns of bone we call pedicle that connects the front of the vertebral bone to the back part of the vertebral bone. You can insert the screws through the middle of that column of bone. Uh, and they figured out what, that way. And these screws uh, on the back, they have a tulip that can accept a rod. So you can put as many screws as you want in the levels that you want to fuse. And then these tulips stick out in the back and you put a rod on these tulips and you tighten them. Therefore you immobilize uh, spine. Uh, well, when they uh, showed this device, these pedicle screw in American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in 1985, everybody said, oh my God, this is what we've been waiting for. Perfect. So it became very popular in the United States. So we started doing them. Well, there, there was a problem. Uh, the initial results were not good at all. As a matter of fact, and oh, by the way, all the information that I have is from Google. These are published. These are not some conspiracy theorists or anything like that. These are published articles by uh, Wall Street Journal. And some of the investigations were done by United States Senate. So you can't get more legit than the United States Senate, I guess. Uh, so by 1993, early 1990s, there were 7,000 lawsuits against the manufacturer of this screws, a uh, company called Medtronic. And the lawyers not only sued the manufacturer, but they sued the doctors too. So there were about 500 lawsuits against American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and North American Spine Society. So uh, there were these things going on. So at that time, early 90s, World of Spine Surgery went through a great turmoil. So what happens is that in 1993, a surgeon called Dr. Zdeblik, He's still a chairman of uh, spine surgery in University of Wisconsin today, as we speak. He published a paper, uh, and in that paper, he said that these screws work beautifully, just perfect. They're better than anything else, and the patients are so happy, and we all have to use them. So when he published that paper, then the use of these pedicle screws became uh, standard of care. By the time we hit 2000 or so, uh, we use these screws for every, every time we did a fusion surgery. Well, here comes me right around 2013. In 2013, when I was doing these surgeries, I realized that we have a problem with these screws and this is how it goes. The vertebrae, the backbone is not a solid block of uh, wood. It's not a solid block of like cement. It's a, like a shoebox. Uh, the outside bone, the shell is cortical bone. It's a very solid bone. But the inside bone is a spongy bone we call cancellous. Well, the problem with these screws is that they get inserted inside the vertebrae. And by the time we hit 70s or so, we had a very big problem with these screws because the cancellous bone is very... Um, uh, susceptible for osteoporosis. So they all melt away, basically. So these screws become very ineffective. So in 2013, I wanted to invent a device. I knew we had a problem in the elderly population, age population. I wanted to invent a device for elderly population. And I came up with a device uh, that it was a flat plate that sit against the lamina. Now, lamina is the back part of the vertebral bone. It's a flat plate that covers the canal where the nerves travel through. It's a cortical, it's a purely cortical bone, and it's one of the strongest bones in the body. And it doesn't get affected with osteoporosis. So I had a flat plate that sits against the lamina and has a tulip that sticks on the other side of it. Now, this plate uses composite straps to wrap around the lamina. And there's a hole in the base of the tulip that has a clamp built into it. So the strap wraps around the bone, goes through that hole, and it gets tensioned like a zip tie. Then once you do that, a clamp 
that has a screw on the middle of the tulip. You can turn the screw and it clamp clamps the strap. And basically, this device holds on to vertebrae without penetrating the bone. This device uh, was, of course, in a, my device was in a prototyping stage. So I started uh, showing it to surgeons. And actually, it won the award in 2015 in Congress of Neurological Surgeons. I won the Innovation Showcase. That means that doctors, surgeons in charge of Congress of Neurological Surgeons, they thought that my invention was worthy enough, important enough to be presented to the rest of the neurosurgical community. So that happened. After that, 2015, 2016, 2017, as I was trying to uh, develop and refine this device, I started having some problems uh, with the tool, with the angulation. I said, well, let me see what this problem is in the screw and how they dealt with it in screw, or does the same problem still st exist in screw or not? So I started writing, reading papers about the screw, and when I found out, it, my jaw dropped. I mean, it just got so bad. And I, and, and, and it just, one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And it was just like, my God, what is going on? So this is what happened. When I looked for the papers to see the efficacy of the screws, I found six, six papers, multinational, multi-center screw uh, papers that were published in late 1990s to early 2000s that said these screws don't work at all. They do not increase fusion rate and they do not improve outcome for sure. I was like, wait a minute, what is going on here? And these papers were published in our spine journal. They're not some papers that somebody published in some book or throwaway journal. Spine journal is our journal. This is what we, everybody has, you know, um, um, a membership and stuff. So I get it uh, every twice, twice a month. Uh, so it was published in Spine Journal. So we all knew about these papers. But when I put them all together, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? So I went back, I said, let me, I got to investigate this a little bit further. So I went back and said, let's look at that paper in 1993 by Dr. Zdeblik. Uh Let's look, find out a little bit more. The first thing that I saw was, again, jaw dropping. This paper in 1993 was published by him only, and it was published as a preliminary report. I spent two years to look for the final report, and I couldn't find one. Eventually, I talked to one of the professors in the Midwestern uh, University, and he told me, he said, oh yeah, no, that study was abandoned in the middle, and it was never finished. I was like, are you serious? How is that possible? If you Google that study right now, if you put down Zdeblik spine fusion right now, you will see that's been referenced in 1,106 articles as of yesterday. So that paper by Dr. Zdeblik is the most referenced paper in the entire world of spine surgery. I mean, I was like, oh my God, an unfinished, a preliminary report. Let me look into this. Let me look into Dr. Zdevlik, see what's going on. And it got 10 times worse. Well, I found out through an investigation by United States Senate that he published his paper in 1993. By 1996, when those 7,000 lawsuits were disappearing, he started getting paid from the same company, Medtronic. By the time... By 2004, he had gotten paid $34 million. And according to the Senate investigation, they said Medtronic really never documented why was he paid for it. They alleged that it was for some inventions that he had not seen his inventions. And I can't comment on that. But, you know, the, the Medtronic really didn't document why he got all this money, basically. So, okay, so he publishes a paper, uh, lawsuits disappear, then six papers comes out and said it doesn't work. Then he gets paid by 30, 2004, he got paid $34 million. That's bad, right? It gets 10 times worse. So in 2005, Medtronic put Dr. Zedeblik in charge of another very important study. 
This study uh, was about a bone substitute product. Uh, you know, when we do the fusion, as I said, we put bone chips. Well, that bone chip's got to come from somewhere. And we have to take it from a donor site, mostly the hip. Well, the problem with that is that that donor site becomes a problem and starts hurting. So we wanted to avoid that. So Medtronic came out with this product called BMP, bone morphogenic protein. It's a hormone that we all have it. Uh, when you break your bone, it gets excreted and then heals the bone. They have, they have brought it as a product. So they put him, Dr. Zdeblik, in charge of that study. This time, Dr. Zdeblik got caught modifying his results. As a matter of fact, this triggered a Senate investigation. And per, I'm not talking about Wall Street Journal or Boston Globe or anything like that. Per United States Senate, the United States Senate came to the conclusion that that paper that was published under his name in 2005 was not written by him, was written by the company. Ooh. Right, right. Ooh, I, and I'm not making this up. You can Google it. It, no. was, it is so crazy. So I was like, what is going on? So now you got to understand this stuff doesn't didn't come to me like with a flash. You know, it took like three, four, five years of just intense thinking is like, what is going on? So in my head, it's like, wait a minute, what is going on? It's like six papers, six papers, award-winning. Some of them won awards for quality of the research. Six papers, multinational, multi-center gets ignored. An unfinished paper by somebody who has not such a great track record becomes the quintessential anchor for an entire specialty. What is going on? So it took me about three years to find the answer. And I eventually did. And this is how it goes. We became orthopedic surgeons first. In, in training, you, become, you do five years of orthopedic surgery. In that five years, your exposure to spine is very minimal. Then you do one year, only one year of spine surgery fellowship, and then you become spine surgeons. So what we did, we learned what we learned from orthopedic surgery, and we applied that concept to spinal surgery. We should have never done that. Why? Spine surgery is a completely different field. There is nothing in orthopedic surgery you learn that's going to help you become a better spine surgeon. I'm telling you not. This is after like years of me doing research and development. Why? Well, the concept of rigid fixation works because of one important thing. In the uh, arm and the legs, if you have a construct that you're kind of worried, let's say it's weak, you can eliminate gravity. You can put the patient on crutches. You can put the patient on sling, so you can eliminate gravity. In spine, you can't eliminate gravity. You cannot suspend the patient in the air for three months at a time. So the second that guy gets up, the patient gets up, that yeah. construct is under constant stress. Uh, so we need to have a new set of rules, new set of um, instruments that I call reactive rigid fixation. So it's not flexible. It is rigid, but it can move, it can give, and it can dissipate the energy. Uh, and this concept is no different than uh, building buildings, uh, high rises in San Francisco in an earthquake zone. You know, we learned uh, that uh, if you want to have a building in an earthquake zone, you don't make it stiff, you don't make it tight. You actually put it on rollers yeah. and let it swing a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so that way it doesn't fall down and just crack and, you know, basically. Yeah. So you make it a little bit more, it can give. Same concept needs to apply to spine surgery, basically. So what I'm trying to promote now is that we have to go back. And nobody wants, none of the surgeons wants to accept this. What, I, what I'm saying is that we should go back to training. Spine surgery was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery. Spine surgery needs a lot more training. A year is absolutely not enough. And not only that, whatever you learned 
in orthopedic surgery, you got to unlearn that and then relearn spine surgery. Is that crazy? I mean, I just well, I say yeah. this to people. Are you running into people that are just really uh, threatened by the things you're saying? Because it's, you know, uh, it, it, I'm sure a lot of people that do what you do realize this as soon as you say it. They go, oh, yeah, I've been thinking that for a long time. But, you know, here we've got um, big companies making a medical device uh, that doesn't work. It's still been use, I'm assuming, these screws, because I just, you know, I know somebody I that's am, got screws. And I, I am and you're using, saying I am. You're, yeah, yeah. I am using it myself. Why? Because people the same ask me the same questions. Like, well, are you using it? I'm like, of course I'm using it. I'm using it every day I do these surgery because it's the standard of care. I'm not going to start practicing my own brand of medicine. Then I'll be right. really in trouble. Right. You know, you I yeah. do. Right. I do what, because if I don't use it and this patient, there's a problem. This patient runs to another spine surgeon. That's the first thing they're going to say. They're going to say, oh. He doesn't know how to put these screws, and that's the problem, you know. It's very so, frustrating, I would think, right. for you to to know. I mean, because really, what you're saying is you're upending the entire educational uh, uh, model for your. I I can't. I, I'm just blown away that it's only one year. I, that to but, me, when I think about what's inside the spine and the nerves and the muscles and all the the bones, I mean, it's it's everything. It's the entire root system of the body when you think about it the you know it's right. the tree but trunk it goes, right but it goes beyond that see a spine surgeon that i that i try to explain in my book every clue is important the way the patient walks to my office the patient sitting in my office the patient that gets up from the from the seat these are all clues Everything that the patient tells me, you know, hey, in sleep, this is what happens. When I do this, this, everything is a clue to, for me to see where this pain is, try to figure out where this pain is coming from. Well, we completely ignore this part. <laughs> we completely ignore this part of spine surgery. We went just right into the, you know, the teaching is basically is this right now. This is, this is how spine, and this is what I did for the first 10 years of my practice. Patient tells you you have back pain, neck pain. You look at the MRI, two disc path, two level surgery. Three disc path, three level fusion. Four disc path, four level fusion. That's what we do. You know, I mean, uh, there's no, there's no, let's figure out where the pain is coming from. I mean, I highly doubt the four discs start hurting at the same time. But in these big surgeries, chances are, I mean, and I'm sure chances, 100%. Patients are really getting surgeries that they don't need. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and a big surgery that they don't need. So we have to, we got to just change the spine surgery the collectively from the beginning. Let me tell you this though. My wife didn't want me to write this book. My wife was so against it and so scared, even to this day. This morning she was talking to me about this stuff. Uh, she was like, you have a great, career you've done very well uh you can just ruin it you know people are going to come after you and i told her i said once i found this out i can't go to sleep at night i can't live with myself this is spine surgery spine surgery doesn't belong to spine surgeons spine surgery doesn't belong to companies like Medtronic. this is people we are this is for patients we are wrecking these patients this cannot, you can't have, and, and let me tell you this, I thought about this for three years. So I didn't like just jump in three years. I tried to decide if I should write this book or not, because spine surgery went through a trauma in early nineties. I'm talking about trauma. Very famous spine surgeons were dragged to United States Senate. There were, Senate, there were two Senate investigations on these screws. They were dragged to the United States Senate. So spine surgery went through a trauma, and it all eventually passed. And I'm opening those wounds. Am I doing the right thing? Is this what needs to be done? And it always comes down to the same answer. We can't have a specialty that relies on an unfinished study by a guy that has a questionable track. It just can't happen. Well, that thing I have to say is the truth is the truth. So, if, if, and you can either not speak it or you can speak it. You've decided to speak the truth. And I think that's really important because it shows that you care about the actual. 
people that are, you know, going under the, the, the knife, you know, and it's really, um, a tribute to, you know, your integrity and also to, to the oath that uh, doctors take in the beginning. I'm very taken with the fact that you uh, have the courage to do that. And I understand your wife's misgivings because, you know, we have, you know, a life that we want to have a nice time and we don't want people, you know, giving us a problem. But the thing is, how do you sleep? You know, you, you can't sleep if, if you know something and you're not saying it. Um, th- right. that's, that's worse Then then you're not, then you might as well just not even be around at some point. If you're that kind of person, it's just not worth day to day living. If you're, if you're allowing something that you know better to exist without at least saying something, whether you succeed or not is not really the issue. I mean, it's, it's the important, it's important that that happens, I think, but even if that doesn't right. happen within, let's say your lifetime, it'll be which I think it will, by the way, but uh, the, the... Let me explain to you, let me tell you a story to explain to you what I'm up against. So I was, when I, when I say these things, uh, people might say, well, why didn't you, uh, did you, have you talked to your uh, uh, leaders of the field? Have you brought them? Absolutely. I have chased them down. I have ambushed them. I waited for an outside the conference. I've been treated. Now, don't get me wrong. 80% are sweethearts. They're like, yeah, we know. Yes, yes. But what are we going to do? That's their, you know, yeah, uh, sure. attitude. And some of them have chased me out. Some of them have cussed me out. Some of them have fought me, you know, but, but so, so I get up in these conferences and I, and I say that, why? Uh, because we, I, I got up in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. One time I said, we have, uh, we have made a matrix. We have created a matrix for ourselves. You come to these conferences, and in conferences, all the surgeons, and I'm talking about all, not just one small, all the surgeons, they show their best MRIs, best outcome, best patients, best possible thing. So we come to these conferences, we think like, oh, we're doing a great job. Meanwhile, nobody shows their problems. (laughs) Meanwhile, patients are not doing well. They're ending up in pain management for the rest of their lives. So we've created this matrix for ourselves that everything is good and then but it's not it's just crazy but let me tell you let me tell you a story so i was in a uh in 2016 i was in north american spine society now you gotta understand by that time i didn't have the knowledge that i have now as i said for the last it took me five six years for this knowledge to accumulate so I got up and I said, you know, um, I'm not understanding. There's six papers came out and they know these papers. It's not like they don't know. Uh, there are six papers that came out and said these screws don't work. So what is going on? So somebody in the panel said, well, yeah, we were aware of those papers, but then we did, study, we did studies later and we found out that the screws do work. But, and I didn't want to fight them. I didn't say, well, why didn't you publish that? You know, so I didn't, you know, I didn't want to pick up a fight. So 10 minutes, 20 minutes later, I was in line to get a cup of coffee. And then there was a very established surgeon behind me and I won't name names. And I was talking to a representative from a company. Uh, we we're just chit-chatting. He introduced me to the gentleman above, uh, behind me. And he told him, he said, Dr. Asley, Dr. Asley doesn't like the screws. He said, oh, you're the gentleman that made that comment. Well, I got to tell you that uh, everybody's welcome for their opinion, but I just want to tell you that you were very wrong. I said, uh, it's not about me being wrong or right. As a matter of fact, I have nothing to do with this. It's about research. The published research says that this stuff doesn't work. Maybe, just maybe they're trying to tell us something. He said, I know. I published those papers. Those are my patients. I'm like, yeah, what's your name? He said, my name is this. I'm like, I had the papers in my hand. His paper was the second paper in my, in my hand. Is it my name is this? And yes, he was the fifth author on that paper. So that's me. See, these are my papers. I'm like, well, let's read your paper. The last sentence in the paper said, based on the current uh, evidence, we do not recommend routine use of pedicle screws. He looked at it. He, he looked at it again and said, no, that's wrong. And he walked away. <laughs> oh, God. His <laughs> own... 
paper. Well, he's a he's he's in denial beyond uh, beyond but, the pale. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. And what about the guy who got the thirty four million? Is he he's still around and and working and and it somebody? Gets, let me tell you. Let me tell you this. It gets ten, you, you see so far is not bad. What what have I told you? Did I tell you every time you think it doesn't get worse, it gets ten times worse? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something that even beats everything that we've I've told you so far. So this guy, Dr. Zedeblik, from 2002 till 2018 or longer, he was the chief editor of a major spine journal. Yeah. Never in the history of medicine, a company has had such a direct access to a literature in the specialty of medicine i mean it's just crazy it's it's, it's yeah what a shill it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and 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 you know and let me tell you this when i talk to the uh, professors this is what they tell me yes we know so this is not something that they argue yes we know so far we haven't been able to show that these pedicle screws work with research, but we will in the future. And, and, and I'm like, wait a minute, those are two things going on. That, that you just said is a definition of insanity uh, to yeah. do the same experiment over and over and expect a different result. That's yeah. exactly what's happening That's in the world of spine yes. surgery. Right. Two, every time you fail to show that something works, you have just shown that it didn't work. <laughs> these are not these are not these are not two separate events you know this is the same event if it didn't work uh, if you fail to show that it works that's exactly means that it didn't work you know so we have shown over and over that the stuff doesn't work so you know but let me tell you one thing there you know I, i've done these podcasts and stuff and sometimes they want to refer me as a whistleblower uh, I want to make it very clear that I'm not a whistleblower, and that has very important implications. Why? Because if I am a whistleblower, that means there's a malicious act going on, and people need to go to jail. Well, some of them going on. I mean, some of them is going on, no question, you know. Uh, but I don't think that's the situation. I really think I am a researcher, and I am a scientist. Uh, and I came upon these because I was doing this detailed research and development. I think it has to do with our training. Spine surgery, being a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery, that's how we get trained. The, it, the five years of orthopedic surgery, they put it in your brain. You get imprinted in your brain that the answer to any question is a screw yeah that's what they do it's it's basic construction work and that's not what the spine is the spine isn't is from what i'm gathering it's not and it seems like you know i don't think the, necessarily that uh, i'm certainly maybe the companies that are making these things because they're making a lot of money they don't want it to stop they don't want the income stream to stop so in that oh respect no. so in that respect that's conspiratorial, like a real thing. That's not, it's not a theory. It's actually, I mean, they're, they are, you know, keeping things, the status quo, but it seems like in terms of the medical profession, the inertia has gone in the wrong direction and it's hard to stop. You know, it's just like this snowball going down a hill. Nobody wants to stand in front of it and get, get rolled, rolled over. Uh, right. it's, it, so it's, you know, it's the path of least resistance, not to resist at all. And it's it's Correct. it's unfortunate that you know human beings are are you know um, driven by convenience and you know not rocking the boat and those kinds of things and um, you know I understand right. that I think probably most of the doctors and your associates you know like you say they know but what are we going to do you know and it's 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 sad for now correct yeah. correct well you know here comes me and I tell you guys I know what to do <laughs> but yeah, but I gotta. <laughs> First thing, first thing that we need to do, uh, let, me, let me explain to you something else. In 2020, I walked into my office and there was a journal, uh, spine journal. The lead article in our spine journal said, this is word for word, undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. What does that mean? That means our own journal is telling us that our data is tainted. So 
So the first thing that needs to happen is to just cut off the influence of these uh, instrument companies from the science of spine surgery. I tell the spine surgeon, I say, look, if I'm wrong, if this screw is the best that it gets, okay, I'll just, you know, complain. Eventually I'll shut up and I go disappear. Fine. But if I'm right, and that's what the research says, can you imagine what we've done to our patients? Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine what we've done to medicine, to healthcare? It's, it's the uh, medical version of uh, the political lobbying is really what it comes down to. It's just, it's just money over um, in decency, <laughs> put it that All way. Right. Except, except, except the outcome is patient in pain and misery. I mean, the outcome is 100 times worse. Let's briefly at the end here, if there's some, your idea of a, the simplest version of a solution would be would be a wonderful to, way to end this because we'll, let's end with a little bit of hope because we got hope. Correct. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm saying that actually I'm offering hope. I'm offering correction. Well, it needs to come back to the training. Spine surgery was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. It, need, it deserves its own residence. Okay, so that's number Simple one. That. It's own. That's it's number own. One. Okay. That's two, okay. two, we need to sit down and figure things out. We need to become scientists. I wrote, write it in my book. I say, you know, nowadays, if you are, to me, if you're a consultant, that means you are an undercover operative trying to advance the agenda of that company, basically. That should not happen. Spine surgeons need to realize that they have legions to people, to patients. We are their giver, caregivers in a way. So they need to be impartial to these products that they're trying to evaluate. That's the next thing that needs to understand. Some sort of a separation between corporate and medical care. That, uh, Correct. That a set Correct. of uh, either um, guidelines or, uh, you know, I'm not sure how to do that. I'm not in that world. But, yeah, that, that, that seems good. Okay, so training and then a separation between money and, and medicine. Correct. Correct. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, because I know like some of the pharmaceutical industry, they, you know, they, I, I have a friend, she used to sell pharmaceuticals. She was a very attractive young woman. And she goes, it was basically we were, you know, selling pills like like a prostitute would sell their bodies <laughs> to doctors. <laughs> right. Goes, yeah. She goes, it was just unbelievable. If you knew what went on and now, you know, well, geez, thank you so much. And you, so let's let's. uh talk about where people can find your book and and um, what whatever else they need to do to find out more about this. Right. My book uh, sells in Amazon, uh, Corporate Spine. So that's all you need to write down, Corporate Spine. Uh, it's in Amazon. It's only $25, so it's very cheap. But the amount of information that's in there for back pain, because I didn't want it to be just a book that just complains about things. So the first four chapters are me teaching patients public what we go through as spine surgeons to evaluate the patient for a surgery or no surgery. And then the, uh, the other four chapters, so chapter five to chapter eight, that's when I talk about the controversy or so. So uh, it's, I tell people, I say, it's your duty to read this book because it's something that involves everybody. Even if you don't have a back problem or back surgery, uh, your child, your son, daughter, your father, your uncle, you know, somebody's going to be uh, affected by this. Absolutely. And I tell people that it's not only it's your duty to read it, but it's your duty to let everybody else that you know to read this book. And I, I agree with everything you're saying, because I think it's important to know as much as possible about a situation before you act. It's very important. And the last thing you want to do is surgery. It's as you said in the beginning, it's, it's the, the third piece and, um, you know, I, I'm going to give you one quick story for me. I uh, I had some issue with a meniscus in my knee and it kept hurting and hurting. And I went to this guy and he pushed on it and it hurt a lot. <laughs> and he did an MRI on my knee and he goes, let's schedule the surgery right there in the office. I said, oh, let me get back to you. I don't know my schedule. I went to my chiropractor. She said, why don't you do the rehab you would do after the surgery before the surgery? See if that changes it. I've never had the surgery and I don't have knee problems. So that was a very simple solution. I'm not saying everyone that's the solution for everyone, 
Uh, I had back issues. Pilates changed that for me. And a surgeon told me to go do them. He, he's the one that told me. So I give, I don't even remember his name. It was 25 years ago, but, and I was like, this is a good guy. He doesn't want to do something that isn't necessary. And I know you're the same way. It's like, you know, right. surgery, if needed, is a great thing. Uh, but, if- but you got to understand, I wasn't that way then. When I, the first 10 years of my practice, I was that guy that you just said. Oh, because sorry. That's <laughs> what I was, but, 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 that, but that's how I was taught. You know, that, yeah, was, sure. that was how I was trained. You know, it wasn't until later that I was like, wait a minute. You know, hey, what's going on here? You know? So, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, it all starts from the training. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really, uh, intense and informative, uh, talk. I really appreciate it. And, um, good luck on all your endeavors. I think it's important that, uh, what your important work, I love my truth tellers and you're one of them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Much appreciation for you folks listening in to The Exploding Human. Check out the website, theexplodinghuman.com, the YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. I also want to thank Dr. Ardavan Asli one more time. Please get his book, Corporate Spine, and find out all things you would ever need to know or, or a loved one might need to know about spine surgery. Have a great day.